We have uh, some minutes for uh, just a few questions. Uh, I don't know if there is also off campus someone asking. Check. Sorry? I will check. OK. And uh, even here, I mean, uh, it's up to you. I teach operations, so I'm not able to ask. Uh, you know, I work for a German company, Siemens, and uh, you know, in, they uh, focus the investment in three sectors. Mm -hmm. One is industry, energy, and uh, healthcare. So they see this uh, sector as a long-term growth. And if you see the last five years of result of uh, Siemens, Siemens is around 100 billion uh, right. dollars revenue. And uh, in this, this year, you know, basically last month, they launched a new sector. And uh, we had a conference last autumn, and they talk about infrastructure and city. Mm -hmm. So they want to increase by 25% of the revenue right. of, of the company investing in this uh, uh, new sector. Yep. And, uh, and uh, this is, is a quite amazing, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's a company generating 15 billion of euro of uh, cash flow each year. And the question is a little bit because, you know, we were confronted in our reality in Italy, especially, you know, when we are uh, looking at the, you know, 2015 with this expo, where, you know, it's very difficult that to have uh, investment from uh, the uh, government or for uh, the, the, the municipality and so on. Uh, what is your view? Because I think uh, uh, the strategy, uh, the vision is, is correct, but how can be implemented in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Western countries, especially maybe uh, in, 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 in Europe and in, in the States, where I see on the other side from a uh, uh, country like China, where they need to create this infrastructure. What, what is your view on, on, on this uh, uh, vision and strategy of, uh, of uh, Siemens? Um, I, got, I got a mic, so. Um, I think it's brilliant. I mean, you know, if I wouldn't worry too much in business terms about the fact that the advanced countries may or may not be able to afford, you know, the infrastructure upgrade because the, the opportunities in the emerging markets are gigantic. I mean, if you dig around in the McKinsey study or Goldman Sachs' analysis, I mean, you'll find that China is, you know, well over 25 percent of global investment in another 10 or 15 years. Now, there's market access issues, and the Chinese sometimes screw around with that. Um, and, you know, and need to be told that's not probably going to work or the technology transfer process is going to stop. And, but, but by and large, I think there's a huge, a huge set of markets there in two, in two categories. Um, one is just supplying products, services, and equipment, you know, to all of this stuff, you know, transportation systems and so on. The other one is governments, with the exception of China, can't afford the infrastructure that they need. So there's an investment opportunity on the public-private partnership side as well. And I can easily imagine a Siemens doing both. That is, you know, being a, a supplier of, I mean, your main business is a supplier of the goods and services, but you could also, with a balance sheet that looks like that, be an investor alongside. And those deals have to be structured properly, so none of this is kind of easy. But, but India is fairly far down the road. And it's the other place that, you know, is going to build a massive amount of infrastructure in cities and transportation systems and ports and other things. Some of it's going to have to be done with public funds because there's no real way to structure the public-private partnership. But, but, but for the kind of main business of Siemens, I mean, I think it's kind of huge. Uh, and indeed, in general, multinational companies of various sizes, you know, are playing in a in a, in a world with very large numbers of opportunities. Uh, and doesn't make it a simple world to operate in, but multinationals run and move these global supply chains that lie behind what I just talked about a minute ago very efficiently, increasingly efficiently, finding markets, finding you know, supply chain opportunities, uh, and so on. And people ask me, you know, where do you invest if you want exposure you know, to the emerging markets and don't know what you're doing and don't want to take the currency risks and so on, it seems to me the answer is, you know, if you get the price right, invest in the multinationals that, that are becoming major players in those markets uh, in the first instance. 
The flip side of that really doesn't have to do with Siemens, but when the Chinese say, do you think we should keep buying United States Treasury bills? I feel disloyal saying this. Um, I say no. You know, it, managing your exchange rate requires you hold dom dollar and euro denominated assets. They don't have to be the United States Treasury bills. If you're willing to move up the, the sort of risk return spectrum, you know, you can buy some other stuff, provided you don't get blocked. And, um, uh, and I expect them to do that. I mean, I think three trillion is probably just about enough of, you know, European and United States government bonds. So. But anyway, I think it's a huge opportunity, and I, I'm not surprised a company of the quality of Siemens is moving, moving into that. That's just a huge. The other big opportunity that is perceived by many Italian companies, among others, is a whole variety of consumer products, some for the middle class and some for the growing group of people who are relatively well-to-do, so luxury products as well. Pharmaceutical companies, cosmetics companies, you know, brands uh, are all... Uh, facing huge market opportunities and then finding their way into these um, markets in a way that kind of works. Automobiles. Um, so I wouldn't resign and go to work for anybody else. <laughs> anybody else? Any other points, question? Just uh, one. I have one. Yeah. Uh, even if... Uh, Many sources are forecasting a sharp increase of inflation given the cost of uh, food, the cost of fuel, and some industries are importing inflation, but they are not able to export by transferring on prices. So in the last decade, we yeah. managed by moving the supply chain in the low-cost countries, which is the next step. Well, we'll continue to do that. That may not solve the problem, but we have not exhausted yet, mm. you know, the labor supply out there because there's a lot of late starters. Mm. Now, you know, you can see the end of the line on this, um, on this thing because we now have the major economies in the rapidly growing part, so it's not going to last forever. And it's very hard to know what will happen to relative prices when we run out of surplus labor, but they'll probably for sure change. On inflation, um, Major challenge in the emerging economies is getting inflation and related things out under control. If they screw that up, they'll have problems, in term, in, including growth problems. I don't think the best bet is that they won't be able to manage. Mm -hmm. um, commodities, I think, you know, were uh, on an upward trend until we hit the crisis. In fact, we had a commodity price spike in <coughs> the high point of which was about midway through 2008, came down fairly fast. Um, and it was serious. It caused inflation in the um, emerging markets um, because it's a larger fraction of GDP. Remember I was talking about the poor countries? They consume fuel, food, and not much else. If you go look at a poor person's budget, it'll be, it'll be on the order of 50% food in these countries. So you triple the price of rice or some staple, uh, there's a pretty big effect of income effect. So there's a distributional aspect of it, an inflation aspect, which was more serious than for, our, our, for us. So they do have to get it under control, and it's not, it's not that easy um, because there's, there's the second and third round effects that they want to cut off. But, but they can't cut off the first round effects. Most of these things are set globally. They're global prices. Um, probably... The, the commodities are being driven by, mainly by the restoring of high rising demand, as was true before the crisis, but also by the low interest rate policies. So people are speculating and using at least some commodities as a, as a hedge against inflation, and that'll probably continue for a while. I expect some volatility on that front. Um, and then, of course, they're in the advanced countries, you know, if the exits are mismanaged, I guess the risk of this is probably larger on the American side than the European side. The, the European Central Bank seems quite, you know, sort of <clears throat> determined about this. And uh, whereas I think in America we're actually running some risks. And as you well, you well know, um, you know, countries, <coughs> major countries don't default. Um, they inflate their way out. They restructure by inflation. And so you, if you back yourself into a corner, you might say, I mean, you get inflation because you have no other choice. Uh, 
So that's a risk that I think is real. Um, from an investment point of view, the global economy is a, is, has a lot of tail risk in it right now, um, and which is hard to handle. Um, I don't think it affects mainly companies, but investors have to wrestle with it all the time. Okay, <clears throat> listen, I have a bad news, a good news. The bad news that unfortunately we have to stop here, I never ever heard one hour and a half silence, at least during my session, so it was uh, <laughs> fascinating. The good news is that we can continue by drinking something outside, okay? okay. Thank you very much for being here.